How many of you, I wonder, have heard of the Marvel Comics characters known as the Avengers? Raise your hand. We're talking about Captain America and the Hulk, about Spider-Man and Iron Man. We're talking Black Panther and Black Widow, uh, Wolverine and the Wasp, and so many other in, in incredible figures. I remember as a little boy back in that 15-year-old and younger spread that I would save up my allowance in order to buy those comics. And I would get them in bulk if I could and often would hide under my covers at night with my flashlight and read the comics long past I was the time I was supposed to be uh, asleep. You can imagine how thrilled I was when they turned these comic books into major motion pictures. Uh, I was uh, one of the first to get out in line to go to these movies as they began to, to come out. And I've seen just about every single one of them along the way. But I will tell you that when I watched one of the last big Avenger movies, I was absolutely devastated. The movie was called Avengers Infinity War. I wonder if any of you saw that one. The very title of the movie is suggestive, I think. It tells us that it is going to be about a really huge battle, and it is. It's about a a fight for all of the cosmic marbles in a sense. Literally, six infinity stones, they're called, whose possessor, when he or she amasses them, will have unthinkable power. And, and the major figure in this storyline is an arch-villain by the name of Thanos, which I did a little research on and discovered via our friends at Google, uh, is a Greek word that literally means the immortal. Thanos the immortal. Now, if ever there was a blacklist character, it is this guy, Thanos. Because over the course of the story, you see him uh, coercing and co-opting and corrupting all kinds of people. You see him uh, using and abusing other people. At one point, you actually watch him sacrifice his own beautiful daughter, allowing her to fall to her death in order that he might continue on his relentless pursuit of the power he will find if he can collect all six of these infinity stones. And the story ends with Thanos succeeding in that objective, uh, collecting the, the final infinity stone and then using this newfound cosmic authority to annihilate half of all sentient life in the universe. Now just take that one in. Half of all sentient life in the entire universe vaporized. And we watch in this movie, in horror, as precious lives all over the cosmos disassemble and disappear right before us. The camera zooms in on the desperate faces of, of, of people we've come to know and love very well, people like Spider-Man and Black Panther and so many of the other heroes as they literally come apart. They disintegrate into pieces and then are swept away like dust in the wind. And the movie comes to an end at this point and you're left just sitting there with your mouth hanging open going, this is terrible. It can't end this way. It just can't. So you hang on, at least I did, for what has been called in the movie industry, borrowing from the software industry, an Easter egg. A surprise feature that the movie producers place after the credits. You, for those patient enough to stay while all the credits roll, there is so often in some of these movies, at the very end, a final scene. Usually a joyful scene, a humorous scene. So I hung in, I sat in my seat, waiting for the credits to finish. And to my utter delight, a final scene came on. And, and hope surged in me because the camera now zoomed in on the figure of Nick Fury. Now, if you don't know the Avengers story, you may not know that Nick Fury is the founder of the Avengers. He is brave beyond compare. He's got a vision. He's got grit and guts. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, at last, Nick Fury is there, and he will save the day. And then, no! 
Nick Fury starts to come apart. And I'm going, I can't believe this. And, and Fury grabs hold of this kind of paging device, this ultra-sophisticated communicator, and, he, and you see him frantically typing in a message, but he's, just, he's dissolving, and the last thing to go is his hand, and the very last thing to go is his thumb, and he hits send. And the communicator clatters to the ground. And... Our hero is no more. Now, I tell you this story because in more ways than may be immediately obvious, Easter is actually a story something like this one. Uh, For thousands of years, Christians have approached this season that we call Lent, with this deep awareness, often confessed on Ash Wednesday, that dust we are, and to dust we shall return. Christians are people who live with hope, but they know the hope comes on the back of a dark reality that sin and death have imposed a curse upon this world and that the effect of the power of sin and death is to disintegrate things, to to break things down uh, instead of to build things up. And, And for the followers of Jesus on Good Friday, that reality must have seemed like the entire storyline, like where the story ended. Uh, The movie, of course, had not started that way for those in it, Mary Magdalene and Peter and John and James and the others that we read about in the New Testament had actually signed on with Jesus in the very first place because he seemed to them to be the ultimate superhero in a sense, the supreme avenger, we might call him in our day, but in their day they simply referred to him as the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one literally, the anointed one, the one who had been sent to save us who had been sent into the world by God to free human beings from bondage, to tyranny, and to the power of sin and death. And they had seen a lot of sin and death in their time, these disciples. It was, uh, they were not shielded from it in the way that many of us in suburbia today are shielded from the darkest parts of life. Uh, They were exposed on a regular basis to the horror of what human beings can do to one another. I don't think there was probably a single disciple that had not been within earshot of a rape or not known of somebody who'd been the victim of such a rape. I doubt any of them uh, uh, had been um, shielded from watching children being abused. Kids were not regarded as very precious things in the ancient world. They were treated very badly in many cases, especially if they were poor kids. And, and they had seen many a man uh, driven towards a, a vision of manhood that we would be very uncomfortable with in our particular age. Staggering wealth in their time was held by a very few number of people. The vast majority, by the way, in this time were enslaved people. And most of them very, very, very poor. Just a few people had tremendous power while the rest were essentially uh, victims of the circumstances of life. They struggled just to put food on the table. The political world was a disaster in many ways. It was a first century parade of figures who made very big promises often and then mainly took care of their own peeps, their own tribe, their own little clan, their own family, were well taken care of, but the populace in general left to fend for itself. Life was a dog-eat-dog war. It was a constant struggle, a world of disease and decay and despair, and it was apparently controlled by those with the biggest stones, the most powerful people. They, They did okay, but the regular person, and you and I probably would have been one of those people, they were just left to try and make it in any way they could. And then, Then along comes this rabbi from Nazareth. And and Jesus was not like the typical religious figures or the typical political figures of his day. He seemed, on the other hand, to see the value of everyone. 
children, women, men, slave, free. Jesus seemed to see the value in everybody. And, and he called for uh, the respect for life wherever it was found. Jesus was a, an advocate for, uh, for caring for people. He saw the beauty and the goodness in the simple things like bread and wine and seeds. He saw these things as windows actually of a larger grace at work in this world. Jesus taught that the greatest wealth in life was relationships, uh, that we shouldn't be confused. The most important thing in life was a relationship with God and with our brothers and sisters, and that we should recognize that even in the faces of strangers, we're family, just yet unrecognized. Uh, Jesus had a, a passionate sense that leadership would be shown through servanthood, that the greatest leaders would be the servants of all. Jesus proclaimed the transforming power of forgiveness. He said, this world will not change. There is no hope for this world where forgiveness, even for one's enemies, does not eventually triumph. And he spoke of the joy that comes from using your resources not to build your own life up, but to lift other people up. This was, this was the teaching of Jesus, and he modeled this. He healed, he fed, he empowered people wherever he went. And, and kind of like people who were going to one of, to, in mass to one of those blockbuster movies that uh, come out about this time of year and continue on through the summer months, uh, people just streamed to see Jesus. I mean, vast crowds lined up to get into the presence of Jesus and to see him do his stuff and listen to him speak. Rich people and poor people and, and restless people and stuck people and searching people all left their homes and their preoccupations and they went to see this Jesus and they found in him this clarity about life and this compassion towards people and this power in his presence and his vision. In fact, they would say of Jesus, he speaks with a power and authority greater than the scribes and the teachers of the law. How is this? This uneducated man speaks with such authority. And, and, and gradually over time, many people came to think, you know, that if this world operated by the principles and the practices that Jesus is modeling and teaching, it would be a different kind of kingdom than the kingdom of Caesar. This would be a much better world. A much better world. And, and, and so a lot of them just held fast to Jesus. Even when his, the edge of his teaching got sharp, even when he said that there's going to be challenges and even suffering that goes with following me, the, a bunch of these disciples refused to leave Jesus behind. In fact, at one point when the crowd had gotten a little bit thin, Jesus turned to the disciples and he says, well, will you also go? And Simon Peter, ever the one to speak up, did so again. And he says, Lord... To whom would we go? You have the words of eternal life. And by that, he, he, he meant, Jesus, you inspire us to a higher kind of life, a better kind of life, a God-filled sort of life. You inspire us to be the kind of people that this world needs. We might say in our time, you make us want to be avengers You stir up that vocation in us. But not everybody felt this way about Jesus. Thanos didn't. Thanos and the people under his influence were opposed to Jesus and all that he came to do. I, you note I called him Thanos. That's uh, anachronistic because that character didn't yet exist. Or did he? I might as well have used the word Satan or Lucifer or the evil one or the adversary or maybe Voldemort or Saruman or Cruella because every culture and every single religion and every single place has always had a word for him, has always had some term to describe this force, this spirit, this intelligence that we sense moving opposing flourishing 
breaking things down, uh, preventing the forward motion, at least for a season, of God's good intentions. The movies keep introducing us to characters like Thanos because we keep sensing his very real spirit in our world in so many places. Thanos delights in dividing countries and must be thrilled at America today and how well that's going. He loves to divide communities, to turn people who have nothing but different skin color against each other. He, he, he delights in wrecking marriages and in ruining the relationships between friends and between other family members. He likes to disease bodies and disfigure personalities and get people addicted to stuff that will kill them and they think is helping them. He is the ultimate blacklist villain, Thanos says. He is the worst of his kind and his bad breath breathe through so many people in so many places today. Do not be naive about him. He wants all the marbles. He wants you, your life, my life, this world. He's bent on taking power to himself and fighting a God who, though he has all power, is a generous giver. And on Good Friday, it pretty much looked like he'd won. I mean, no more beautiful or powerful person than Jesus had ever walked on this planet, but now his mission, his person, were obviously doomed. The co-workers that Jesus had assembled for his movement were now scattered. Towering figures like Judas and Peter had either betrayed or denied or abandoned Jesus and the rest of the disciples, they were just cowering in fear, afraid that they too were going to be arrested. The ultimate avenger, Jesus himself, was disintegrating. Literally coming apart. I mean, his body had been ripped to shreds by a cat of nine tails, 39 lashes. I, you, you, I don't want to even describe what that does to a human body. It's just the most awful thing you can possibly imagine. And now he had been hung on a cross to die. The worst, most torturous, agonizing form of execution ever to be imagined by humanity, Jesus is now succumbing to. He is struggling even to breathe. His life blood is ebbing away, running down his body, down the cross, onto the ground. Everything good, hopeful, wise is disintegrating. It is dissolving. It is dying away. And like Nick Fury in a last ditch attempt to hit send, uh, Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then it is finished. There's just silence. God doesn't come down. There is no hope, it seems. And it is silence. And then it is finished. And the screen fades to black. And the credits roll. I talk probably almost every single week to people who are living that movie in some sense. You know, it's one of the things that pastors do is we, we get inside of the real life stories of people. And though people, especially at an Easter service, come dressed quite nicely and put together in lovely ways, the storyline of many of our lives underneath the surface is a lot more messy. It's a lot more complicated. There are people even in this room right now for whom some amazing loved one has died. Uh, maybe in recent days, maybe in the, in the recent past, uh, or maybe for some others the medical diagnosis has come in and it is catastrophic. I was called by a friend this week who said he was going up to Mayo and they were testing for a, a deadly disease and it was looking likely that he had it. Others here know the pain and agony of a love relationship that did not work out and it's over. 
or the job that is suddenly taken away, or the dream for that child or for yourself that has now faded to black, or the political scene that looks so hopeless, or this sense that life feels so miserable and empty and meaningless and lonely. There are many of us at some point in our lives, finding ourselves feeling like we've lost the war for whatever mattered most to us in this life. I know that's not everybody here. Thankfully, it's not all of us here because if we were all in this condition, man, it would be so depressing. Thankfully, some of us, it's, life's going well right now. And if it's going well for you right now, if you're feeling like a superhero right, right now, that's wonderful. Wear that Iron Man suit as long as you can. I hope your spidey senses stop you from any harm. Surf that wave as long as you're able. But I have to tell you, Friday's coming. Friday is coming. Nobody escapes it. Thanos will not let that happen. The day will come when what you've trusted and depended upon disintegrates. It is one of life's tough certainties. Even those little aches and pains that have started for some of us, this is just the warning sign that that process of disintegration is relentless. Jesus said that into every single life, the storm, the darkness, the doubt, the shadow of death is going to eventually come. The credits will be rolling and we will be eventually left in shock like the figures of Mary and John standing before the cross, their mouths hanging open. Jesus is dead. They can't believe it. Let's hope only that in those moments we'll have each other to hold on to in those difficult moments as the darkness sweeps in. The Bible tells us quite a bit about Black Friday when so much that was good disintegrated and seemed lost forever. Have you ever noticed, however, the Bible doesn't tell us so much about what happened on the second day? The Bible's phrase so often is, it talks about these three days. We know that first day, Good Friday. We don't hear a lot about what happened on the second day, what Christians have come to call Holy Saturday. We have to imagine that the disciples were just left sitting there. They were just in the darkened theater of life as the credits rolled. They must have needed that time, I suppose, to start to deal with the shock and the loss and struggling just to make sense of everything that had happened. I want to suggest that we need those Saturdays in our life. Every one of us needs those Saturdays. Because when somebody we care about or we ourselves have endured a significant trauma or loss or something that has happened in our lives that makes us or our loved ones doubt God uh, or ourselves or other people in a very serious way, we shouldn't just try and get up and go and rush past it. We should sit with it. We should honor it. I've lived through some dark Fridays in my life. Some of you know my stories. When my family fell apart, our house burned, people that I love were murdered. They were taken by disease. They gave in to suicide. And it was so horrible that I just went numb or I self-anesthetized myself to get numb. I was really grateful when the day two came, when that day two period came, when there were these people who just gave me the, the freedom to sit with this stuff, who didn't try and cheer me up and make me rush past it or just let me grieve it, gave me permission to sit with the mess of it all, to feel the confusion and the numbness, of all of this loss and change. I have this wild theory that one of the reasons why the Bible doesn't give us more information about Holy Saturday and what the disciples were doing there is because God was allowing them space. He was just creating a safe space for them to absorb that crucifixion 
to feel it, to ponder it, so that maybe they might eventually get to that point that I hope all of us can get to when we've gone through terrible pain and loss. When, when the most important question begins to frame itself for us. And the most important question is, is there something more to this story? I mean, I know what happened yesterday. I know what I'm feeling today. Is there a tomorrow? Is there a sequel to this story? What's going to happen on the third day? Over spring break this past year, I, I went back to the movies. I went uh, with one of our boys, and we went to see a movie called Captain Marvel. I don't know if you've seen that one. Uh, it's another Avengers flick. And uh, I walked into the theater. I didn't really know a lot about this character. Uh, but it stars uh, Brie Larson, a wonderful actress in the title role. And she plays this very human being, this very likable, accessible, ordinary human being who is nonetheless endowed with uh, incredible supernatural powers. One almost would say divine kinds of powers. She is a person with feelings and experiences, uh, hungers and appetites and needs like you and I have, and yet she also has these remarkable capacities that you and I definitely do not have. Um, and those abilities aren't obvious at the start of the movie. Um, and by the end of the story, you begin to realize that this person is unlike anyone you've ever seen in any movie. This, this was the impact on me. I mean, this superhero could defeat Superman with her pinky. She makes Wonder Woman look like a wimp. Captain Marvel can fly. She can channel energy. She can survive death. She can fire power rays from her hands that can destroy any kind of evil. I mean, I walked out of this theater and I thought to myself, how have I never heard about this person? How did I miss that comic book that I didn't appreciate? The ultimate superhero that Captain Marvel uh, is. And, and I'm thinking to myself, this is a person that can change the conditions of any battle, any war. She's a hero of such mind-blowing power and integrity that you have this absolute confidence that if she is in the game, if she is around, everything's going to be fine in the end. In fact, there is also an Easter egg scene in the Captain Marvel movie. Spoiler alert. Cover your ears, la, 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 if you don't want to hear this. Because after the credits roll, there is a final scene. And it's a remarkable scene. Because in that scene, we're taken back to another movie to the end of Infinity Wars. And we see the, the last of the Avengers in desperation and fear and confusion, probably like those original disciples were. And we, we realize that what Nick Fury was doing when he pressed send was calling for her. And she comes. And she arrives. When all hope is gone, then came marvel. Against every cynical, jaded bone in my body, I found this surge of joy rising in me like I was a teenager. Like a geyser, I thought, there's hope. Marvel lives. And then it hit me. Where else have I heard of a hero that is fully human and, in a sense, fully divine? What other, what other person has got life-changing power in his hands? 
who else shows up when all hope was lost and, and brings hope again and demonstrates the power to overcome death itself, disintegration itself. And as I walked out of that theater, I remembered, oh yeah, Hollywood gets all of its best stories from the Bible. <laughs> it always does. In fact, I, I think the reason why um, these stories are told is because there is this almost primordial sense deep inside of us that there is a, a, there is a hope deeper than, 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 than the popular environment provides for us. And these stories keep dredging that back up for us. In fact, I think the writers, uh, I'm sure they didn't intend to do it, uh, were simply reflecting that desire we have for the kind of marvelous hope that we do actually find in Jesus. Because this, friends, is the story. Good Friday comes. The goodness of this world is being dissolved in the face of evil's blacklist themes. On Holy Saturday, the world is just sitting there in silence. It's just brewing like the space that some of us are living in right now today, kind of like the feeling we have as we leave the theater before the next uh, movie has started. But on the third day, the all-important sequel came. The defining sequel came. The ultimate avenger returned to overcome the power of sin and decay and disintegration and death itself. And he displayed the supreme power he has to do these things by doing what no one else has ever done. He returned from the dead. He rose from the grave. He showed himself alive. And it isn't a movie. It's history. It's history, this thing that happened. Real people went to the tomb and experienced an Easter egg there that none of them expected to find. They found the huge stone that should have sealed Jesus in for infinity rolled away. Where there should have been a disintegrating body they found no body. They actually found the grave clothes abandoned like the chrysalis of a butterfly, a life that had simply metamorphosized and moved on. And it wasn't just a few people. This Jesus showed himself to many of them. He let them touch his hands, the wounds in his hands and in his side, he appeared to more than 500 people at the same time and to many, many others over a period of some 40 days. And the encounters that those individuals had with the risen Christ wasn't just a yawn. Oh, that's an interesting thought. It altered their lives. They went from being cowering people to being some of the most courageous people that have ever lived willing to take on any challenge to spread this message, willing literally to be crucified themselves rather than deny the marvelous good news that Jesus was indeed the Lord of life and everything that he had said about life can be trusted, can be built upon. And their passion to extend his kingdom to, to, to work for his mission, to restore flourishing in this world, rippled out and altered well, Western civilization and gradually cascaded out till it swept into this community and created this church and this movement that you were invited to be a part of today. I know that it's easy to just come to church, but I want to encourage you to remember God's intention is you are the church. You are the ones he has chosen to fight evil, to extend the frontier of good and hope and flourishing in this world. You are somebody he intended from the beginning of your life to live the heroic life that this world needs more of in our time. I know that responding to that call can be hard. Uh, Rick and Kay Warren, the founders of Saddleback Church, the author of the 
purpose-driven life went through a devastating loss some years ago, just a few years ago, when they tragically uh, lost their 27-year-old son, Matthew. And about a year after this tragedy, Rick said, you know, I've often been asked along the way, how have you made it? How have you made it? How have you gone on in the midst of your pain? And I've often replied, well, the answer is Easter. That's how I've done it. That's how we've done it. It's Easter. You see, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus happened over three days, he said. Friday was the day of suffering, pain, and agony. Saturday was the day of doubt, confusion, and misery. But Easter, that Sunday, was the day of hope and joy and victory. And here's the truth, says Warren. You will face those three days over and over again in your life. You will. And when you do, you'll find yourself asking, as we did, these three fundamental questions. Number one, what am I going to do in the days of pain and suffering? Where will I turn? Two, how do I get through my days of doubt and confusion? Who will stand with me? And three, how do I get to the days of joy and hope and victory? And the answer to those three questions, he says, is Jesus and the community that he has created. He knows the plans that he has for you. Guess what? They're not disintegration. Their resurrection, their renewal, their restoration, their reconciliation, their life. And he has established communities like this church here and others that you can find out there to be places where you not only experience more joy and victory and more help in the times of doubt and confusion and pain than you could anywhere else, but you are actually allowed to be a part of bringing those gifts into the lives of other people and there's nothing that can beat the joy and the privilege of doing that. So I just want to say happy Easter to you. Happy Easter to you. Come on back in the days to come because there is a sequel even to Easter. There is. And if you will return and experience it, you will discover that the adventure of your life is just beginning. Please pray with me. And now, Lord of life, you who are the magnificent marvel this world has been awaiting, strengthen us by your presence and your power. Draw us more deeply into the heroic community of your followers. Send us forth this day to be the force of faith and hope and love that this planet so desperately needs that long ago you sent Jesus to be our Savior. And it is in his name that we say Hallelujah. Amen.